Welcome back. In this video, we'll talk about how to diagnose latent tuberculosis. In particular, we'll look at what diagnostic tests you can order, and how to interpret the results when you get them. Now, as we talked about in the last video, this whole process really starts with recognizing that a person is at some risk of having been exposed to TB in the past, whether because of known contact, or more commonly, having grown up or spent significant time in an area where TB exposure is common. When you've recognized that someone is at risk, the next step is to offer a diagnostic test to see whether they have, in fact, been infected. There are two types of tests available for the diagnosis of latent TB, which are the interferon gamma release assays and the tuberculin skin test. Both of these tests are recommended for the diagnosis of latent TB by Australia's National TB Advisory Committee. So understanding something about how they work and their strengths and limitations is helpful for deciding which you're going to use. You'll see here that I've called them the Quantiferon TB Gold and the MAN2 test, which is because these are the versions of these tests which are currently available in Australia. Both types of tests are looking for evidence of immune reactivity against tuberculosis, and they rely on the idea that people who've been exposed in the past will have a reaction if they're again exposed to TB antigen. By and large, these immune reactions are long-lasting, and people who've had a positive result by either test tend to stay positive long-term. The MAN2 test is a subdermal injection of a purified protein derivative, or PPD, which is extracted from cultured TB. Now, people who've been previously exposed to TB will develop a local reaction or swelling at the site of injection within two to three days. And so the test is completed by a second visit to measure the size of that reaction after three days. On the other hand, the interferon gamma release assays, or IGRA, involve drawing whole blood and then adding it to test tubes that already contain TB-specific proteins. When previously sensitized T cells come into contact with those proteins, they activate and they release interferon gamma, which is then measured in the lab. Now, while both of these tests are similarly looking to see if the person has been exposed to TB in the past, there are three particularly key differences between them. First, and most obviously, the IGRA is a blood test done in a commercial lab, while the MAN2 test is an injection mainly done in direct clinical practice. Second, as the MAN2 needs to be read after three days, it means a second clinic visit to check the result. Finally, the PPD used in the MAN2 test contains a large number of different TB proteins, some of which are also found in the BCG, or the TB vaccine. This means that people who've had the BCG vaccine can also have a positive MAN2 test as a result. Uh, the IGRA use a different set of proteins which are not found in BCG, so this cross-reaction doesn't happen. These differences may affect which test you choose. For example, I'll often choose an IGRA when I'm testing an adult with a history of BCG vaccination so as to avoid any confusion about cross-reactivity. If I'm testing an infant, though, I prefer to use the MAN2 test because it can be done without having to take a blood sample. For both tests, though, having a negative result is very useful, and it's reassuring that someone is at very low risk of developing TB in the future. One final thing that's very important about both tests is that because they're looking for an immune reaction, these tests can be positive in both latent TB and in people who are actively sick with TB disease as well. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But for now, remember that a positive test suggests TB infection rather than telling you one way or the other about whether they're sick right now. It's worth making some practical comments about test availability in Australia. Access to MAN2 testing can be quite variable in different parts of the country. In Victoria, at least, there is very limited commercial availability. And so testing is mainly done in-house by high caseload clinics and programs. The IGRA are widely available through commercial providers, but there are some limitations to Medicare eligibility. The current MBS criteria are shown here, and include both those at risk of exposure and those at high risk of progression, but it may not include everyone who you consider should be tested. For these people or those who don't have access to Medicare, commercial costs will vary, but typically are around $50 to $60. When it comes to interpreting the tests, the MAN2 test relies on the size of the local reaction to the injected PPD, which means that experience technique is important. A positive reaction causes an induration that can be palpated, and then the diameter is measured. If you get a MAN2 result provided to you, 
it will report the number of millimeters across. And the report won't tell you whether that's a positive or negative result. The reason for this is that different thresholds are used for groups at different levels of risk. A reaction of more than 15 millimeters is always positive. Greater than 10 millimeters is used for people who've not had a BCG vaccine, and greater than 5 millimeters is used for people with significant immunosuppression. As I mentioned earlier, people who've had BCG vaccination can have positive results for that reason, and there's a risk of false negative tests when people are on high-dose oral prednisolone or other immunosuppressives. When you order an IGRA, on the other hand, this will come as a commercial assay, and it will provide a report something like this one. The mitogen, or the PHA here at the bottom, is a check to make sure that there's enough of an immune system response for the test result to be reliable, so it's listed as acceptable. As long as that's the case, a result of more than 0.35 in either of the other tubes is considered a positive result, and the report should also provide a conclusion below. Like with any test, false positives and false negatives are possible, but selecting people who are at background risk of TB exposure makes that less likely for both tests. So, regardless of which test you use, if you've got a positive result, you still have to consider the patient before you can conclude they have latent TB infection. There are two very important questions to ask at this stage. First, does this person have active TB? The reason why you have to consider this is that both tests for latent TB tell you that a person has been previously infected, but they don't distinguish between active and latent TB. You therefore need to ask about any symptoms that could suggest active TB, including cough, fever, weight loss, lymphadenopathy, particularly when these things have been going on for weeks or longer. Every person who has a positive latent TB test should also get a chest x-ray, as early disease can have minimal symptoms. People who have no symptoms and a normal chest x-ray can have active disease effectively excluded for the purposes of latent TB treatment. The second question is whether the person has ever had treatment for active or latent TB before, which is important because tests for latent TB tend to stay positive long-term after treatment. So even someone who's had their infection treated effectively in the past will have a positive test, and they shouldn't be given another course of treatment. So at this stage, you've thought about TB, You've done a test for latent TB, and you've excluded active disease. This leaves you ready to start latent TB treatment when it's appropriate, which we'll talk about in the next video.